Hey everybody, today is one of those exciting days that we have a new portfolio published on a stock as a stock pick page. This portfolio is one of my dream portfolios because there's a dream team behind it. And uh, I have the pleasure of having Simon Erickson, the founder of this dream team and dream company, to tell you all about their portfolio. Simon, welcome to Stock Cards community of portfolio publishers. Oh, thanks very much, Hoda. I, I do think we have the dream team here at Seven Investing. We're really excited to partner with Stock Cards. Perfect. Thank you. So, Simon, we, we want to just get uh, the fellow stock guardians, um, get to know you, get to know your team, your investment philosophy, all that good stuff. Um, so without any delay, I just want to just jump in and ask you to introduce Seven Investing and tell us about how you guys came about and what is the investment philosophy behind the work you guys do at Seven Investing. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Uh, we, we like to think of ourselves as long-term buy and hold investors with a keen focus on innovation. And so what we believe is the best returns in the stock market take place when you compound wealth for long periods of time. But in addition to that, we're really looking for the next five or 10 years out from today. We don't want to find yesterday's winners. We want to find tomorrow's winners. And so a lot of the research that we do is kind of on these new innovative things that are taking place, right? We've got advisors that are focusing on cloud computing and biotechnology and artificial intelligence and digital payments and all these really neat things that are going out there. Uh, but rather than just looking at headlines, we're going to conferences, we're interviewing CEOs, we're digging into clinical data because we think that that's where the secrets of the stock market success are gonna come from. Uh, so we're very analytical, we're very innovative. A lot of PhDs on this team from a diversity of backgrounds and uh, it's really a lot of fun to find the market's biggest winners of tomorrow. Oh, that's perfect. So I, I love that because obviously individual investors can read or get all the data that is available, information available online, but that firsthand conversation with CEOs, going to conferences, not everybody can do it by themselves, like start going on an investing tour all around the world or around the country. So that is super cool that you guys do. Are there specific analysts that are assigned to a specific um, ideas or specific innovation, or do you guys all collaborate together? How does that part of the research goes? We have a diversity of viewpoints and everybody tends to follow a different sector within seven investing. Uh, Hoda, we have seven lead advisors on the team altogether. Anirban Mahanti is based in Sydney, Australia. He's a PhD computer scientist and he really wrote a paper on a lot of the things that went on to be the technology that went into Netflix. And so he's kind of on the forefront of new inventions and, and new developments are taking place in AI, networking, cloud computing. Um, also, my colleague, Steve Simonton, actually worked in machine learning back in the early 2000s before artificial intelligence was really kind of a headline or anything anybody was using out there. Uh, he worked on doing machine learning for the government. He follows a lot of these software as a service companies, especially those that are using AI uh, in their applications. Uh, myself, Simon Erickson, I'm a huge fan of disruptive innovation. I like it when there are large markets out there that are served by incumbents, really, really large players that are meant to fail because technology changes and there are new entrants that find a new way of doing things that breaks uh, the existing status quo of things. My colleague, Dan Klein, is uh, really looking at retail investments, really into entertainment and retail. So these aren't as, you know, as, as innovative perhaps as AI, but he's just got such a thorough understanding of the operations of the retailers out there. What does it mean when things are moving to e-commerce? What does it mean when entertainment is moving to live streaming? Things like that is something he really takes a close look at. Um, Dana Abramovitz, uh, PhD biochemistry. Uh, she also got a postdoc from Scripps International. Uh, she really looks at biotech. She really looks at what's going on in the biotechnology world really interested in RNA interference right now and kind of you know, digging into clinical data. What does this mean? And how is this going to impact this $4 trillion market that we have that's, that's American healthcare? Very expensive, needs a lot of fixes, right? And also our colleague, Max Chatsko, also looks at life sciences and healthcare, really digs into clinical data. Max also has a unique perspective on renewable energy and his background is really into you know, getting into the nitty gritty of the technical details on things like this, to see things uh, that, that I won't see when I look at that same kind of data. And then Matt Cochran, our seventh advisor, uh, really, really understands the digital payments ecosystems across the entire world. Not just what that means for companies like PayPal and Square in the United States, but there's different ecosystems regionally popping up in India, in China, in Southeast Asia, 
Uh, there are different pockets of this. And you really understand how those are all interconnected and how those kind of companies are making money. So kind of a neat little innovative twist that we put on all of these, but we cover a diversity of different markets out there. I love it. That's super cool. So um, how do you guys stay focused on these innovation spaces? And this is one of the most, um, I guess, question, one of the most asked question on the Stock Guardian community is that we all come with this perfect strategy or, I mean, people say, come up with these perfect strategies and they come up with these criteria, but then the market goes crazy and some, some, some meme stocks show up or some, you know, some sector just gets a lot of, a lot of um, uh, excitement or momentum. And it's very, very difficult to stay true to that strategy. How do you guys stay focused on that strategy? And if you have any uh, tricks or a little bit of secret that you could share with our users or our stalker community to, to, to figure out how they can fo stay focused on that perfect strategy that they've identified at the beginning. How do you guys do it? I think it's a combination of two things, really. One is look at top-down uh, investing, look at markets that need solutions and have pain points, uh, and then really getting into finding the companies that are, that are taking advantage of those and being patient, right? Uh, so the, the top-down approach is just you see things out there that, that, that are, are changing. We see developing trends that are taking place. Life science is a perfect example. We talk about gene editing, gene therapies. I mean, that is a big, big trend that's just getting started and is very expensive today, but could be a much more personalized way of providing healthcare uh, rather than subjectively treating patients based on symptoms that are already occurring there. And then the, the, the patient side of that is, you know, finding the companies that are harnessing these tools to take advantage of it. Uh, Hoda, we're, we're recording today, you know, it's, it's Monday morning here for, for, uh, for California. We just saw uh, Intellia Therapeutics is up more than 50% this morning because they did uh, some successful results that they just resulted from the, from the phase one trials using in vivo CRISPR tools, right? That's something that's been around for a while. They went public years ago. We saw the progress that was taking place with them, but it takes patience to see something like that when you can see a stock pop 50% uh, in one day. It doesn't just happen overnight out of nowhere. It's something that you, if you do the fundamental research, you see the changes taking place in the markets, and then you find the right companies if you can get in early for things like that, you can be greatly rewarded when they when they do pop like that. I totally agree with you. I was just looking up on uh, NTLA's or NTLA's uh, stock card, and it's 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 super interesting what happens because last year, I believe, should probably fall of last year, and in, in the middle of pandemic, the whole gene editing uh, had this whole buzz or boost from the the Nobel Prize. Uh, that, that um, what is her, what is that professor's name out of um, uh, Berkeley? Do you remember her name? The person Jennifer who came Gardner, sure. Yes, oh, there, yeah. there you go. Thank mm -hmm. you. So after she got the Nobel Prize, there was this whole excitement about gene editing stocks, and then they all went to the moon, and then uh, the excitement kind of went above, uh, went, went away, and everybody were down. It's so critical to have that conviction to stay through and stay put with your, whatever you're owning, and maybe even add more. It sounds very easy, but it, it's very, very difficult um, to, to do that. That's why we have portfolio publishers like you and your team on the stock cards, uh, stock pick base, so that they can actually show the example and keep giving the conviction and you know confidence to the followers and say, stay put. This is the reason. This is the this is the logic where we're um, uh, we're we're we are holding the stock. So I love that. Um, so Simon, let's get a little bit personal before we get into um, some of the other questions I have. And I will tell everybody because I have a good stock pick. Uh, I want to ask Simon for a good stock pick and why and want a stock to avoid and why. So that exciting part that everybody looking forward to it will come soon, uh, a little bit uh, later at the end of the show. But um, maybe we get a little bit personal with you. How did you start investing and what actually put you in this path of a starting company um, that basically is involved with investing in innovation. And um, just tell us a little bit about your path. Sure. Thanks very much. So, so I started my education as an engineer. Actually, I'm a graduate of chemical engineering program. Um, a lot of my engineering buddies gave me a hard time for going the business route after graduating and then spent my 20s as a direct sales rep. Um, so I was working for an advanced materials group, selling specialty chemicals, you know, driving around, flying around, staying in the same courtyard Marriott every night that felt like my, my own room four days of the week. 
Uh, but it was out there like seeing these, these trends taking place, right? Every company that we sold to wanted to come up with a new product, wanted to get a higher margin, wanted to get better profits for their own businesses. And kind of gave me exposure to kind of see how product development works and see how, how companies all want to be at the forefront and ahead of their competitors. And uh, took that after you know a good chunk of time through all, through all my 20s doing, doing sales. I went back and got an MBA, uh, went into strategy and planning, planning after that uh, for a large oil company that was trying to figure out renewable energy. And so we developed a lot of the projects, a lot of solar projects for that. Um, how does the economics of something like this going to make sense? So it's not just, you know, PR, it's not just a pipe dream that, that gets headlines out there. It's like, hey, actually, if you're going to build a business around this, uh, you're going to have to, you have to show profits at some point in the future too. And so we worked with our venture capital group too. We went out and some acquired some companies and some technologies, had some deep pockets at that time to fund some really cool things uh, to improve the efficiencies of solar panels. And then after that, I worked for seven years uh, for The Motley Fool. I ran a couple of services for them there. I uh, tended to focus on the growth style, investing angles of that, uh, finding new markets and new trends that were developing, and then the opportunities that arose from those as, in terms of individual stocks. And then Hoda, my most exciting uh, part of my entire professional career was launching Seven Investing here in March of 2020. Um, I think we have a, I think we have the best team that, that's out there in terms of stock pickers uh, and being really in, in front of the market and seeing where it's going. And um, we've had a, a ton of fun in a, in a year and four months and we're still just getting started. Yes, well, congrats on Seven Investing launch. Obviously it's been now more than a year, as you said. But um, it's so interesting how I found you uh, or we found each other is that I remember hearing your voice so many times on a lot of podcasts that I always follow. <laughs> and, uh, and then when I heard you started your company, um, I, was, I wanted to make sure that you'd be part of what we're building on a stock card. It's from a philosophy point of view and from strategy and how you look at investing, we're so aligned. And I know a lot of our followers, a lot of our stock guardian communities members um, are also sort of aligned with your strategy. So super cool to have you there um, and have you on this. Can I add two? We're really excited to work with you too. We're very careful about who we partner with out there. And one of the things I love with what you're building at StockCard is that investing is personal, right? You want to find the trends. You want to find the types of investments that you want to invest in. And maybe it's shooting for the moon and going for the growth. Maybe it's a stable dividend company that you want for your retirement account. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have really opened up a lot of those tools that are so important for people to make their own investing decisions. Yeah. Um, this was something I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to as well. Exciting. So Simon, tell us a little bit about what is your plan for your portfolio on a stock card and how does that work with obviously the broader work that you do as a part of 7 Investing and the work that you do on 7investing.com and your, your, your followers on social media? How does everything come together? What is your plan for this portfolio and how people can follow this and also how can people follow your other work that you do, the broader work you're doing? Sure, that's right. So, so every month, 7investing.com uh, will publish our seven top stock recommendations. Mm -hmm. We have seven advisors. Each of those provides their very best idea. We compile those together. We, we publish seven research reports, and then we provide a whole bunch of content around that to support them. Uh, with Stock Card, we're going to open up a, a select portion of that. You know, So seven reports a month, that's 21 per quarter. We're going to be putting one up per quarter of our reports onto the Stock Card platform. Uh, but this isn't just, just, this isn't just going to be a random report that we pick out there. It's actually going to be our best buy now that our team decides on uh, once per quarter. We're going to have it available on Star Card, and that's going to represent our stock card portfolio for seven investing. And in addition to that, Hoda, we're also on a monthly basis providing advisor updates. Uh, these are kind of what we see in the market, whether those are biotechnology, digital payments, artificial intelligence, or cloud computing, or whatever we're looking at. Uh, we see interesting things that we want to point out for investors to kind of take a special note of. And once per month, we're going to be providing that to our stock card page as well. In addition to that, we're also going to be doing some videos for you, some exclusive videos here for stock card that'll give kind of an inside scoop from our team. Some of these things that we're excited really that's about that's going on in the market out there. Uh, so it's going to be kind of a collection of content and reports that we're going to put up on your platform. Excellent. I love that. And um, at the end of the show and in the show notes, we'll put the link to your stock cards portfolio page. And, and obviously everybody knows you can find your own, your website, your social media, your YouTube, everything else on your stock cards 
uh, portfolio page so people can find you, but I'll make sure the links to those things are in the show notes so that people can find you easily. Um, that's awesome. Okay, now the exciting part. I know everybody wants to know who the portfolio publishers are, but everybody is also similarly excited about to get that one stock uh, that you would want to buy and one stock that you would want to avoid now and why. So I don't want to keep the stock guardians more waiting. So let's just jump into it. So Simon, as of now, what is one stock that you have the conviction to put your own money into it? And uh, tell us why. Well, absolutely. Thanks, Hoden. And a disclaimer before I answer this, that I am one opinion of seven on the lead advisor team for Seven Investing. So uh, this is my own personal perspective on it. I think that we have a great selection. It's very diverse, of a bunch of different things. But our, our best buy now from this previous quarter, which we are going to feature on our page, uh, as decided on by a process of our team, is Taiwan Semiconductor. Uh, the ticker on that is TSM. And what this is, is the world's largest chip making foundry. So they have 57% market share in externally manufactured chips, semiconductor chips. These are going into processes, they're going into memory. This is when the world is really excited about using artificial intelligence. Uh, they need to have the hardware that can keep up with those algorithms. And so Taiwan Semiconductors for decades has focused exclusively on making other people's manufacturing of those chips. Hoda, we're in the age of AI right now. You know, you're seeing everything move to the cloud. You're seeing all these algorithms getting more and more copy, computationally heavy. Uh, that takes a lot of horsepower, a lot of work, and a lot of clever chips that can, that can get that done. And so the design of these, you know, you see companies like AMD, you see companies like NVIDIA, they're designing really, really neat processors, but they need somebody with the expertise to actually manufacture those. And so Taiwan Semiconductor is the company that does that. Uh, they are by far the global leader in this space. There are internal production fabs for, for Samsung or for Intel, but if you're not named one of those two companies, it's very, very, very challenging. Uh, not only to put the money up front for all the manufacturing equipment for something like that, but the IP know-how of making smaller and smaller gates that are going into those transistors that are going into those 12-inch sil semiconductor silicon chips. Uh, so combination of really, really cool IP with um, kind of a balance sheet that's unmatched by anyone else in the world and a niche that's going through a renaissance right now has made Taiwan Semi our top Best Buy now for this previous quarter. I love that. Um, it's, it's an excellent company. Thank you for that pick. I know that we, about a year ago, we had a portfolio, or maybe two years ago, we had a portfolio. We're still, still live on the on Stock Cards portfolio uh, stock pick page. And we call that the, the best of Moore's Law. So Moore's Law, obviously, we all, all most people are familiar with uh, in the realm of chip making. But also, there is a big belief that Moore's Law is this kind of hitting its own uh, end of life. And then now we need to invest in the next generation of the companies that are basically shaping the future of computing, as you said, AI uh, being a catalyst for it. Um, and there is only a certain group of companies that have the technology and the money to invest in building the, the, the plants and manufacturing facilities that can actually do that. In uh, Taiwan, TSM, Taiwan Semiconductor is one of those. So I, I love that. Thank you for that pick. And are you ever worried about because their main business is in Asia, right? As, I, as, as obviously we all know, are you worried about the challenges that exist between political challenges that continues between US and China and whether that would have any impact? Um, that is one of the questions that came up, not recently, but in the last couple of months as, as, as the idea of a US and China relationship is not necessarily at best term and even after the change of the administration, it's not necessarily the best term. Do you have... I know we don't want to get political at all, but like, do you have any thoughts about would that change your strategy? What happens if there's a big news about China and, you know, basically relationship with the U.S. and the stock dip? What would you do if you hear those sort of negative things about it? It's a huge long tail risk, Hoda, which means that, you know, it's probably pretty unlikely. It's a very small percentage chance that U.S. and China go, over, go to war over IP or something really, really drastic happens. Right. But we've seen a lot of political challenges, right, between TikTok, uh, between Huawei bans, you know, political challenges between these two countries uh, has impacted this industry specifically more than a lot of other ones out there. And plus, on top of that, China still considers Taiwan to be part of China. 
even though it's recognized by the international community as a separate democratic nation, uh, it still thinks that Taiwan belongs to its own country. And it has a very aggressive plan on bringing a lot of its own manufacturing in-house, especially in the next decade, because it wants to be at the forefront of, of, of AI and of machine learning as well. So yeah, definitely huge, um, huge risk with something like that happening. We, we have to be comfortable with that as an investor. You know, that's always on the table and you, and you kind of have to keep in the back of your mind. Yes, something really, really big could happen. China could try to annex or nationalize Taiwan and or Taiwan Semiconductor. I think that, you know, may, maybe if you're investing in the company and that really, really bothers you, that's a risk you should, you should be keeping in mind because it's always on the table. Um, but in terms of the economics of the company, you know, and, and you look at the margins that they have, the operating profits that they have, the cash flows that they have and the hundred billion dollars that they're going to be putting into capital expenditures during just the next three years, uh, that is unmatched by anyone else in the market. So if we take the political risks off the table, this is one that the market has decided is, is really the, the winner take almost all in mm -hmm. their industry. Yeah, I love that. I mean, obviously the, 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 the conversation we always, always have with the stock guardians is if there was no risk, uh, it would have been, there won't be any rewards, but the point is you would be familiar and comfortable with those sort of risks and be willing to take that. The most important part to me is just being aware of it, knowing that this may happen so that you don't, you don't get blindsided by, oh, this news came out and so this thought and have sort of a point of uh, plan for it, I believe. Um, that's excellent. I'm looking at the company's the stock card as we speak and Obviously, to, to your point, it's an ex extremely um, a strong company from an operational and growth potential. Obviously, with all good stocks, um, mathematically, it may be considered an, as an overvalued stock. But, uh, but I understand that you're looking at it forward looking. You're looking at it from a future point of view. That's why it, it doesn't matter what was happening in the past, where we're looking at what is happening in front of the company. So really, really love that. So thank you so much for that pick. I'm sure... All the stock guardians are now looking at it and adding it to their watch list and following the company so that they can they can figure out whether that's a good pick for them. All right, so now let's take the the other side of the coin. Um, this was your high conviction by now, but tell us about one stock that you would want to stay away from and uh, why. Hody, you might be getting this answer a lot from other people that you interview, but I'm staying far away from the meme, meme stock craze that's going on right now. It, it seems like every week I hear people asking me what I think about GameStop and AMC still. You know, this is months later that this has been a development. Um, and there's nothing wrong with making money on these companies. I don't want to foo-foo that, you know, some people have paid off student loans and done incredible things uh, in a matter of days by, by getting in and, and out at the, at the right time. The problem that I have with this is, do you sleep well at night when you're doing something like this? It seems very speculative, kind of like you can go put all of your money on red or black of the roulette wheel of a Vegas casino. Um, but when people are telling me, oh, yeah, I'm glued to my computer. I want to see if I'm making money on the, on the hour or the minute. It's really not investing, at least in the way that we think about it. Um, it really seems to be more speculative. Companies like this, um, when, they, when they go up that aggressively in value that quickly, it's not tied to fundamental performance of the businesses. Uh, it is due to valuation multiples expanding. In other words, more people are willing to bid these prices higher or higher, even as revenue and earnings kind of continues to do their thing in a steady state. And that's really dangerous because the tide can turn at any time and the market as a whole can collectively decide, we don't want to be stuck holding the bag with this, I'm selling. And that behavior tends to stimulate more behavior like that, selling, uh, you know, leads to more selling and all of a sudden people who thought they were getting in at the bottom actually were stuck getting in at the top. And that can be very dangerous. You could very quickly easily uh, lose 70 or 80 percent or more of your investment in companies like this before you even know what happened in a matter of days. And so again, we're buy and hold investors. You know, we're not trying to chase hype or momentum. Uh, every company we've ever recommended on the seven investing scorecard is there to stay. And our performance reflects a buy and hold. We're not getting in and we're actually even selling any of our positions. And I think that's a very different peace of mind uh, that you get when you're a long-term investor, investing in innovation and growth, but you're not trying to look at it on a day-to-day -day basis like that. Yeah, I couldn't agree uh, more with you. Actually, today we were talking together on Monday, um, is it June 29th today? 
Uh, obviously, by the time people are going to hear this, it's going to be the launch of your portfolio in a couple of days. But as we as we speak, my team is uploading a new collection on a stock card, and we call it meme stock collection. So people can basically just find the meme stocks on the stock card, and if they want to avoid, they can just mark them. These are the stocks that I want to I want to avoid. So thank you for bringing that up. But why is it so hard for people to ignore meme stocks? And uh, how do you how do you how do you make yourself and not getting emotionally attached or get kind of getting off balance of all, all the, the all the excitement that happens around meme stocks what is what is that one trick you could share with the stock guardians that help you avoid getting tangled in this whole craze of meme stocks it's an interesting question because it's not completely unfounded right like the whole meme stock craze started because of the power of of the crowd uh, there were some, you know, analysts that were on Reddit and other social platforms that found out that a lot of these stocks that were thinly traded, low market caps, uh, were kind of being manipulated by short sellers, right? They, they call them the suits on these social platforms, right? They were putting pressure on the stocks that they thought had no catalysts. Uh, GameStop wasn't going to go out there and increase its revenue by 300% year over year. AMC Networks, there wasn't going to be 300% more people going to the movie theaters. It was, there was a lack of things that would, that would pop earnings. And so you can go short on those kinds of companies, or so they thought, because there was no danger of something happening. Until Reddit happens, until there's a mass buying flurry that takes place that puts a lot of pressure on those institutions that were short these stocks uh, to suddenly cover their short positions. And we know of that as a short squeeze. So it's not unfounded. I mean, there is something to this. It's not just complete irrationality uh, that's pushing these stock prices up. The only thing, though, that, that guides me in this, Hoda, which is why I say we avoid these, at least as long-term investors, is you don't really have any connection between the business itself, the fundamentals, such as cash flows, earnings, revenues, whatever it might be, and the stock price valuation. You know, There's so many comments out there right now. Oh, this is going to the moon. Hey, look, I made 200% in 24 hours. It's all about the short-term blips on the radar of a stock price. Very, very short-term oriented. That to me is very, very troubling. It's the same thing that you saw on the dot com. Uh, shoot, when that shot to the moon and then it crashed, it's the same thing that we saw in the irrational exuberance of the housing market uh, that obviously led to the recession in 2008. You're starting to see this mean exuberance uh, happening again. I would say even the housing market right now has kind of got them going, going through some exuberance. You got to watch out for these, these bubbles in the market because they can pop violently and uh, nobody really wants to be losing a lot of money in a short amount of time, even if you're excited about it at the time that you purchased in the first place. That's something that is sort of on top of my mind. My husband and I just bought a house at the top of the craze of the market, but we bought it because we moved from San Francisco to Southern California. Um, so we had to find a place to live in, uh, but it always bothers me. I, I, I thought about it, the housing market, and should we just rent and you know all that good stuff, but same, same worries always applies to stocks because you're again like you're you're investing in your house, but also you're investing in the stock. So you can, it's very difficult to not get emotionally attached to it. But I like your approach. I mean, kind of reminding ourselves this is not the very first time this thing happened. And in the past, we have had similar examples. And then when you go and read it, then it gives you this confidence that yes, it may not sound like it's gonna pop now or it's gonna be it's a bubble. Or it's already, you know, everybody think this time is different, but you know, it, when you read that history, you see that actually it's not different. They were, everybody thought it was, this time is gonna be different again in the past history of the similar um, events. I love that for, I love that uh, sort of lens of looking back at what happened that previous time. Thanks for that. All right, so two last questions. One is um, if you have any uh, advice or one unique um, message that you have for your Stock Guardian uh, followers, the Stock Guardian community that are going to come and visit your portfolio. Um, if it could be a book or it could be an advice, it could be someone to follow on Twitter, whatever that makes sense. What is one good piece of advice you have for Stock Guardians? Sure, yeah. So the book is The Innovator's Dilemma by Creighton Christensen, the father of disruptive innovation. Uh, I've read that too many times to count. I'm going to read it to my kids when, when they're going to bed. It's, it's that good. It reframes how you think about big companies and, and high margins because it's, it's a lot of times open for disruption, which is one of the most powerful concepts, at least in my opinion, in investing. And uh, my personal piece of advice is write down why you're buying a stock. 
You know, if, if your reason for buying a stock is just because you heard it as a stock tip from your, your buddy or your neighbor or your barber, that not, might, might not be as, a, as good of a reason as you saying, oh, I, I went out and I read uh, the quarterly earnings report. I listened to the management team lay out their strategic plan. Uh, I dug into the annual report and saw some things that I really liked. Uh, there should be a fundamental reason, a thesis, why you're buying a company. We talk about this a lot at Seven Investing with our team. We challenge each other's thesis to make sure we're looking at the right things. Uh, but I would say for anybody, anytime that you're investing, no matter how large of a position you're taking, at least understand and write down why you're buying the company in the, in the first place and what you would expect would cause that company or that value of that company to go up over time. And if you're wrong, we're all wrong. I mean, nobody's right 100% of the time. If you are, then I'll give you all of my money and you can, uh, you can run with it. But, you know, at least if you're writing it down, you're paying attention to things like a thesis, it will make you a better investor and you can you can optimize that over time. Yeah, I love that. Um, as a matter of fact, recently, maybe two months ago, we uh, published an update to our stock cards portfolio pages. And there is a reason column and then there, there's a decision column and then there's a reason column. And I personally use that religiously uh, because I manage my portfolio, obviously, on a stock cards uh, portfolio page. And I always write down my sort of the two top three reasons that I'm buying this to stock. And uh, sometimes I go back and I realize actually my reasoning was not right. So it's a really, really good sort of keeping the diary as they call it on your investing. Thanks for, thanks for that advice. And Innovator's Dilemma. I've heard of the book, never read it. So that will go to my audible dog walking uh, time <laughs> that, you know, I listen to, 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 to the book and walk my dog. So that's definitely on my list. I'll definitely do that. And we'll, um, we'll obviously put a link in the show notes so that people can see it and find that book. And uh, I'm going to wrap up. I know you're busy and you got to go to your seven stock picks uh, for the next month. I'm pretty much sure. Basically, where can people find you if they want to get to know you better, get to find your team better? Tell us a little bit about where people should go if they want to know more about you. Yep. Seveninvesting.com. Uh, you can write it out or just put the number seven. Uh, we're, we're pretty easy to find. We have uh, some free content. We have a, a free podcast, a free live stream, and we publish a lot of free articles uh, with our perspectives every month. Behind the paywall, if you do decide to start up a subscription with us, uh, starting January, or, I'm sorry, July 7th, uh, it's $49 a month, $399 a year. That gets you access to our seven top ideas in the stock market every month from a diversity of viewpoints, from a diversity of advisors. And we also provide kind of continual updates, continual company updates on each of our recommendations and a monthly subscriber call where you can actually ask us questions directly and live in real time and uh, ask us anything you want about any of our previous recommendations. We think it's a long-term journey. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, we're here to empower people to invest in their future. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Simon, for that. We'll make sure people have the link to your website and all your social media, obviously, on a stock card, on your portfolio. And people can, when they go on the stock pick page, they can type in seven in investing in the search bar and that will find it, uh, find a portfolio for you, for them in the, all the links there and your strategy and your stock picks that are you sharing with the stock cards community is going to be there. Obviously, the broader work is all, uh, available on your own website. Uh, that's about it. I think we got a good um, information and people get to know you and we're so excited to launch your portfolio on a stock card and continue to collaborate with you and your team. Thank you so much, Simon, for for being a partner and doing this call and uh, also um, every, you know, cheers to all the future collaborations. Thanks very much, Hoda. Really looking forward to it. Yeah. Thanks, Simon.